On this episode of Recruiting Hell, sometimes a sideways movement is the key to moving up in your job search. If you're stuck in a position that you aren't crazy about, making a move inside of your organization or to another company altogether can not only bring you more fulfillment in your work, but also has a high likelihood of increased compensation. My job is to make you as successful as you can be, and that's based on whatever success looks like to you. So for that person that is saying, I'm in a position, I like this position, but maybe it's, hey, I want to make more. Maybe it's, I, you know, like the project work of this position, but maybe I'm not too key on the analytics sides. You know, just some, some examples there. Talk. Talk to your manager about what you like, what you don't like, and then ask for shadowing. So many times people want to get into a different position and they don't know anything about it. And it's very obvious when you interview if you have no idea what you're interviewing for. And it, that's like, number one, why do you want this job? Somebody comes in, well... I heard it pays well. No, no, like <laughs> totally out. That's, I'm like, can I end that interview right there? <laughs> because I know somebody's not gonna be there for the long haul based on pay alone. Pay helps, right? Pay at, of course. it helps you swallow a lot of things, but it, you need more, right? So you need purpose, you need fulfillment. Thinking about what truly makes you happy is it, you know, communicating with people, having these relationships, or is it, getting to work on projects? Is it getting to manage entry-level teams? Is it managing secondary, you know, more advanced skill um, agents? So really just thinking about that and then doing your research. You got to do your homework. Hello, and welcome to Recruiting Hell. I'm glad you're here with us today. I'm your host, Rob Conlon. Episode 25 today, and today's show was intended to be live, but some technological limitations prevented that. Regardless, we'll continue to make major improvements to how we operate here at the show over the coming weeks to bring you better content for your job hunt. As always, the quick rundown of things you need to know to get the most out of this show. Number one, RecruitingHell.com. Again, Recruiting-Hell.com. With our free newsletter, Recruiting Hell Overtime, you're literally just a few clicks away from getting more job advice in your email inbox every single week. Number two, our Patreon partners. Thank you as always. It's great to have you helping others and getting great benefits and sneak peeks into the show. If you love the show, you can show your support with a few bucks a month to help make it bigger and better at patreon.com slash recruiting hell. Number three, be sure to rate this show and or leave a review. Reviews are absolutely huge and help other people find their way to us here at Recruiting Hell to kickstart their career search. Links, of course, in the show description for you to check out. And as always, before we start, we highlight the purpose of this show with our new four-part affirmation that we're going to make it through this. Repeat after me if you'd like. Number one, I deserve to find a career opportunity that makes the most of who I am with the talents I was given. Number two, I deserve to know about and be protected from jobs and employers that would take advantage of me. Number three, asking for help in my job hunt is a sign of strength, not a sign of weakness, and my willingness to seek help in my job hunt will ultimately pay off for me. Number four, I have the discipline and the motivation to succeed in this task. I can escape recruiting hell, and I am welcome at this table to learn the skills to help me win my job hunt. You can and you will escape recruiting hell. Now let's meet today's guest. It's my pleasure to welcome to the show Liz O'Connor. Liz is a provider success supervisor for Exact Sciences in Madison, Wisconsin. She's also a former member of the Wisconsin National Guard and happens to be my younger sister. Liz, it's wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you so much, Rob. I am so honored that you asked me to be on this show, and I'm so excited to uh, share bits of my knowledge that I've learned over the years with your listeners. Awesome. Well, I know you have a lot of it because you've had a pretty exciting career. And before we start that, it is always a bit unusual to have guests on the show that you know 
really well. <laughs> because you can fall into that like inside joke kind of format. But I think in this case, there's enough about your professional journey that I don't know True. that I really haven't asked you about. And I think that it can benefit a lot of people. So we usually focus on the job hunting journey here. But in this and probably some future episodes as well, we're going to be visiting kind of the job growth area of things. So this episode is definitely useful for both job seekers, but is maybe more tuned for those who already hold a job and maybe want to better their station in life. So I asked you here because as far as I know, you've done a lot of hiring in past organizations, but you've also used a lot of lateral movement to find yourself new positions within an organization or even recently as you, you just moved to exact sciences outside of an organization to help advance your career. So let's get a bit of a recap of your professional journey first, all the way from slinging tacos in college, which is part <laughs> one of the jobs I remember, to the great place you are today. Yes. Uh, oh, gosh. One of those jobs in uh, a taco suit standing outside dancing with a sign trying to get people in to, to buy tacos. So you got to start somewhere, <laughs> right? It's it's uh, I, a lot of fun. But so my job journey starts just like that, working in restaurants, waitressing, working in retail, everything like that, until I got what is what I always call my first big girl job. Mm -hmm. And that was with Humana, selling health insurance, which the wild and riveting world of insurance was so much more interesting and fun than I ever thought it would be. I became kind of a nerd in that sense with it and got to help a lot of people, which I loved, and inspired me to say, hey... I want to kind of be a little bit more behind the scenes working with a core team every day as opposed to having, you know, new interactions here and there. So I worked really, really hard to be proactive in saying, hey, what do I need to get into a supervisor or manager position with that company? Got myself into that for a couple of years, loved it and then needed a little bit of a change in uh, work-life balance and found a wonderful new home with Zach Sciences, who just has an amazing culture. And, you know, even within that, I've kind of explored a couple of different um, opportunities to lead different projects and le lead different teams. So there has been kind of this different pattern of, of climbing the what no longer is the corporate ladder, but more so has transformed into kind of a corporate spider web, maybe. And happy to kind of break down more of that, you know, new way of thinking this uh, that's come into our time here. Sure. And I'm glad you said corporate spider web, because I think I might actually steal that for the title of the show. I, I had corporate jungle gym at first, and it's like, <laughs> that's kind of a weird term. But at the same time, you've done a lot of great things moving from position A to position B, which is not necessarily an upgrade or a downgrade, but it's this whole side grade thing. So we're going to, we're going to definitely pick your brain on that today. So you started with tacos and you wound up working for again, Humana and finally a real gem of a company in exact sciences. So that's outstanding. I know your journey through the Humana world set you to be that supervisor and there were a lot of opportunities for you to hire people. But when it came to your professional advancement within that organization, how did you create the strategy for yourself to move, like you said, from kind of that frontline sales position to the supervisory kind of behind the scenes? What steps did you exactly take to make that happen for you? So to start with, it's all going to be a little bit different depending on what field you're in, right? So. Mm -hmm. My goal was to step into a leadership, a people leader position. Your moves are going to be different if it's IT. I can't, you know, get into an IT position just based on building relationships and making, you know, contacts. That's not going to happen. I need a foundation, a set of skills. But with leadership, it was really about communicating with the leaders I was working with finding some really strong mentors, which that was probably one of the biggest things was getting your voice out there saying, hey, I want to be more in this company. I want to take on additional responsibilities and being proactive. No, Nobody is going to drag you up the corporate ladder or through the corporate spider web. It is, and I think spider web works because it's sticky. It is not easy to get from one position to another, and it shouldn't be, right? Because anything worth doing needs to be a little bit challenging. Otherwise, everybody would do it. So 
What you need to look at is you need to first, A, be a good performer in your current role. Nobody, nobody will want to take somebody who is not succeeding in their current role, not excelling at their current role, and move them into another role. Even if it's totally different, I want to see that you are committed to what you are doing to excelling and exceeding at your current duty before exploring others. But that also comes with a lot of conversations between you and your manager, other managers, your peers. So keeping a professional you know, relationship with all your peers, it's easy to get into that buddy-buddy sense with your peers as you're working, but I knew right away I wanted to be in leadership, so I wouldn't go out after work and, you know, party all night with my coworkers. I was friendly, yes, but I kept that kind of division if I wanted to be one day hoping for them to respect my leadership. So a lot of it is knowing your audience, knowing what you're doing currently, and knowing what where you need to get to. So then you just have to fill in the spaces uh, between to find out how to get how to get there. Okay. So you said a couple things, key terms, mentor, find one. Yes. Uh, I'm going to ask you kind of a side question that we haven't really covered. How do you find a mentor? Sometimes you're just lucky. I found... let's, let's pretend I'm not lucky. <laughs> I found my mentor by volunteering to help with a job fair. So... Loved loved my job with Humana. Was like, yeah, I want to go and see if we can get more people to work here. And I went with one of the managers at the time, Brett, who you know, who we're very good friends now. And he, you know, I started discussing with him. I said, man, I love it. I want to like, what did you do? How did you get to where you were? Because he started on the phones. And he kind of gave me the spark where it was like, he said, I think you can do it. I have faith in you. Let's Let's get you where you need to go. He already knew that I had been proactive in, in searching through whatever our company internet had for professional development. And here's my personal development plan that I filled out and handed to my supervisor. And he's like, we we have this. This is a thing at our, this company. He'd been there for like 10 years. He oh, didn't really? know that existed. Okay, so there was a, an existing structure, there but was, nobody was yeah. using it. At least not in our, our department. So I kind of took that upon myself to say, hey, here's a nice worksheet that I can fill out and kind of leads me through. And a lot of companies now use like Workday, which has interpersonal development plans and things like that. Go find those, take the initiative, show show that to your bosses. I, when somebody comes to me with that, I am like loving it. I am like, what do you, what do you need from me? You are, I will go the distance for you because you are being proactive and you're showing me that you will show up and you will go the extra extra distance and that's what I want. Okay. So in a couple of our past episodes, and this is more for the listeners rather than a secondary question here, mm -hmm. we've talked about doing the things that other people aren't willing to do. And it sounds like your journey took a lot of that step by finding the things that nobody else was doing that when you showed it to a supervisor, when you showed it to somebody up the chain from you, they said, huh. This is uh, this is an unusual thing. This is something we we don't often come across, and that sets you apart. I would think. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. It was something that was mentioned, like in one of their meetings. That so it it got my name into kind of the spotlight. And it's you know it doesn't have to be necessary that that I was doing the things nobody wanted to do, but when especially when there are things that are hard on employees but are, like, a reasonable business decision. Being able to help connect the peer population with their management and supervisors and to be that peer leadership is extremely valuable. And it's being that partner with management that gets you seen as, okay, this is somebody that understands what's good for not only our employees, but also for the company, um, and can promote that that message to our people to to get everybody on board. Gotcha. So it's it's almost like being a cheerleader for that in, in the case, but you don't have to necessarily be a suck up. You don't have mm -hmm. to be somebody who is oh he is just in management's pocket. I hate that guy or that girl or whatever it might be. You you have to be pulling for the team, but you have to be pulling for the whole team both employees and management and company, correct? 
Correct. Okay. So, okay. So next question, Liz, when it comes to shifting positions, what's going to help someone who's in a position that maybe they're comfortable with, what's going to help them identify a good position shift for them? So really the first thing that they'll need to think about is the why. Why why are you thinking about a position shift? If you are happy in your position right now, what what would cause you to change? I actually was just talking with one of my team members about this who has applied to and retracted some applications within the company once she's found out, oh, no, that doesn't quite sound like what I what I thought it was. And so I spoke to her about, you know, you, you say you love it right here, right now, but obviously there's something missing. Like, what is missing? What do you, what do you want? And like, in a good way, because people should never be fearful of talking to their managers about wanting to move somewhere else. I think there's many places you can go where people are like, oh gosh, I can't talk about that because they'll, they just think I want to get out and leave. A, a good and a, you know, truly dedicated manager, supervisor wants to see that growth, wants to help you to get to where you want to go. I just tell my team, I say, you don't work for me, even if you, you know, in the reporting hierarchy, air quotes, um, <laughs> if you report up to me, you don't work for me, I work for you. My job is to make you as successful as you can be, and that's based on whatever success looks like to you. So for that person that is saying, I'm in a position, I like this position, but maybe it's, hey, I want to make more. Maybe it's, I, you know, like the project work of this position, but maybe I'm not too key on the analytics sides. You know, just some, some examples there. Talk. Talk to your manager about what you like, what you don't like, and then ask for shadowing. So many times people want to get into a different position and... You don't know anything about it. And it's very obvious when you interview if you have no idea what you're interviewing for. And it, that's like, number one, why do you want this job? Somebody comes in, well, I heard it pays well. No, no. <laughs> like, totally out. That's, I'm like, can I end that interview right there? <laughs> because I know somebody's not going to be there for the long haul based on pay alone. Pay helps, right? Pay at Of course. It helps you swallow a lot of things, but it you need more, right? So you need purpose. You need fulfillment. Thinking about what truly makes you happy is it, you know, communicating with people, having these relationships, or is it getting to work on projects? Is it getting to manage entry-level teams? Is it managing secondary, you know, more advanced skill um, agents? So really just thinking about that and then, Doing your research. You got to do your homework. Got it. Okay, so now I want to ask two questions that are very similar, kind of back-to-back -back here that really touch on this again. So let's talk about somebody who really dislikes their job. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe they're good at it. Maybe they just really dislike that, that work that they're doing. Was this ever the case with any of your positions when there are opportunities? And how did disliking your current position contribute to you getting a new position? So, honestly, that was exactly the case when I started with Humana on, on the phones. I got a lot of anxiety with uh, speaking to new callers every, I don't know, 30 to 60 minutes. It was mm -hmm. it, it was difficult, and sales sales takes a lot of mental tenacity. Um, you know, never doubt that. Did I push through it? Yes. I, I did inbound calls. I did outbound calls for two years. Um, but I also knew that's not where I wanted to stay for the rest of forever. Um, and there's some people that that is great for them. They like to be able to say, I'm done at 430. I don't have, you know, people needing me later at night, whatever it is. And, and they end their day and they, they love talking to people. I, I felt I wanted more and I, I knew I liked the world I was working in, but I loved answering questions. I loved helping my fellow employees. Um, I loved coming up with new processes and ideas and training materials. So I would make a lot of like tip sheets or job aids and give them to my peers to say, hey, this is what I use for 
understanding Medicaid, blah, 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 and kind of get that out there in that way. But that also was me kind of putting things into my pocket and my portfolio of what can I do that when I sit down to interview, if a position comes available, I have a whole binder of stuff that I can pull from for those interview questions of how have you led a project? How have you helped team members? So for me, it was a huge, huge part of why I worked my butt off to get into a supervisor position because I didn't want to be on the phone so bad (laughs) that I worked really hard to get into a position where I just got to work with wonderful team members. I'd take the occasional escalation, which was no big deal because by that time I felt, you know, very, very confident and competent in my, in my role, but it was kind of always funny because I think back and I'm like, man, that was my, my big propulsion was (laughs) just wanting to get so badly into that supervisor position. Got it. Opposite question now. (laughs) What about people who really like their jobs? I've been there. I've had a lot of jobs, particularly recently that I've really enjoyed. What kind of strategies would you give to folks who are kind of hesitant to leave their current position, but they might actually need to because of, you know, pay is not enough or their spouse just got transferred to Houston. What kind of strategies would you use to help uh, folks sort of deal with that upgrade that they need maybe, or maybe is forced upon them? Mm -hmm. I think that's a a wonderful question. I think it also brings to mind kind of a a word of warning that the grass isn't always greener on the other side. Everything looks fantastic when you're having not a great day at work, but guess what? You're going to have not a great day no matter what you're doing. <laughs> Eventually, somewhere, right? Every right. Correct. Everybody has a bad day once in a while. So with that, if somebody's happy in their position, I would think about what is it about that position that makes you happy? Is it the culture? Is it the actual task that you're doing? Is it that you are getting to help somebody? Or is it the pay? You know, there's a lot of, a lot of different things that people will put their their value on it's it's different for everybody so when you look at something and you say oh i feel pretty good in this in this position i don't i don't know if i should make a move or not it it is a lot to consider and number one is think about what limitations you have so there is a difference between i want better work hours versus I have to find something because my spouse is getting transferred halfway across the country, right? So in that case, maybe I just need to land something that pays the bills and has health insurance for now. So yes, I want to be in something that I have the skills for and that I like, but at the same time, I know what my priorities are. However, if if there's nothing pressing against me for that, do your research, see if you have any connections of people that work at places that you are looking to change to, because the last thing you want to do is go somewhere and be like, I made a terrible mistake. Why did I leave? Right. The other thing to consider too, is you're starting all over blank slate. Mm -hmm. Like there are things that if you're trying, if you're moving to different companies that you need to consider too is, you know, does health insurance start right away? What type of coverage is it? You know, I don't have FMLA for the first year. So is that a problem? Do I need to stay where I am because of my benefits? And I think a lot of times people forget about that. And it is so, so crucial coming from the insurance world that that you protect yourself. So it, it should not be a rash decision and it should not be a decision of passion. It should be a, if you feel like you've made a decision, talk, talk it out with friends, with relatives, get other people's input, and then sleep on it for a little bit. Once you've come to that point, then if you decide that's the way to go, go get it. Set set your sights on it, but also make that decision before you actually apply and interview, because you, the last thing you want to do is burn bridges. Right. We'll talk maybe about how to not to burn bridges <laughs> in a little bit. Uh, so before we do that, though, let's talk a little bit about interviewing. You have interviewed a ton of people, if I recall. Yes. Uh, and you've hired a lot of people. If you're looking at the folks who maybe made transfers or lateral moves that you've, you've dealt with, what's the big thing at companies in corporate America 
are looking for when they interview somebody today that everybody's missing? That's a good question. So, you know, the, the corporate America of today, too, I'd say is not the corporate America of 5, 10, 15 years ago. Sorry, right? five it's months all... ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's ever-changing, and really depending on what you are again, looking for as far as your realm of talent, I guess I don't have anything that I can say that people are really missing or that they don't come with. But the thing that in my position I'm always looking for and probably applies to a lot is coachability. So if I'm asking you a question about, you know, tell me a time that you had to solve a customer issue. I want to know what the problem is, what steps you did to resolve that, and what the outcome was. Right. Star method. Yep. So you give me an answer, and you tell me what the problem was and and what you did, but you don't tell me what the result was. This happens all the time. So then I prompt you, and I say, okay, and how, how did that turn out for you? And you tell me how it went. I ask you the next question. The same thing happens. So you give me the what the problem was, the here's the steps I took, and you still don't give me the (laughs) result. Again, this was probably half my interviews, and it it's coachability. If I give you feedback, I don't care if you don't do it perfectly. I want to see that you are trying to implement it, and you're trying to take what I've shown you and what I've given you, listening, and have that critical thinking to say, I know what I need to change, and here's how I do it. I can, if you are coachable all day, I will take somebody that is green as the day, you know, they were born all day if they are coachable and have a passion to want to succeed over somebody that's like, I got 15 years in sales and, you know, I know, I know everything. If that person's not going to listen to the direction I give, I, I will not hire that person. Okay. So you said something really interesting about the actual interview process there. And you said, oh, I don't have anything that people don't do. Yes, you did. You had something very much that people don't do. And, <laughs> yeah, that's, right. and that's taking cues from the interviewer when they're trying to maybe help you out a little bit or when they're trying to say, I need more. And it's maybe not even from an altruistic point of view from the interviewer. They are digging deeper and they're trying to have you kind of follow them in that case. And so for people who are listening to this, I would think that the takeaway from that is, is that if you're in an interview, be exceptionally attentive to your interviewers and how they're communicating with you to see if you can pick up some of those snippets when they want more, especially if they ask you, like you said, the same thing kind of twice in a row. Right. It, it's following their their coaching. And it is... You know, one of the pieces where it will get you to success and people are willing to work with you and and help you if they see that potential through you. Gotcha. Okay. So this this next one, I I actually, when uh, I bounced this question off of somebody else and he said it was an excellent question, so I'm, I'm happy for this one. It's often said that people are promoted to the level of their incompetence and when you're making a career move and you go up the chain, there's a, there's a point at which you kind of end the ability to be good at something because maybe you don't have the education, you don't have the experience, whatever it might be. How can somebody who's making a career move be successful in their new position and not be that new guy, new gal manager that nobody respects because they're out of their professional depth? Can I be honest? I really hate that phrase. <laughs> um, and I hate it because it's not, to at least, okay, in my realm, and again, I always use IT because it's it's fully different, like if I had to code something and I'm like, I have no idea. In my realm as leadership, I don't need to know how to step into the position and be perfect. I need to know how to build relationships and to understand what I need to do to get that team on board and to not be seen as incompetent. But I'm not going to lie to people and walk in and say, oh, yeah, no, I know exactly what I'm doing. 
oh no, I (laughs) fully honest, I'm going through that currently where I'm stepping into a role that is similar, but extremely different client that we're working with. I was laughing because I honestly had to have one of my agents explain (laughs) a process to me like eight times because it it was broken and I was like, I can't understand how it's broken until I understand how it works. And I laughed because we were, you know, uh, I am back and forth and she's like, would it help if I call you? And I'm like, this is really embarrassing, but I'm going to say no, but if you want to give it a try, (laughs) because I just, I knew I was like, something isn't clicking. And guess what? Eventually, yes, we finally understood where they were seeing the problem or the the risk that this upgrade kind of let us, let, let us vulnerable to. But they were willing to work with me because I was honest. I wasn't trying to pull the wool over their eyes. I wasn't trying to, you know, be like, oh yeah, no, you're like, you're fine. I, I honestly, I wanted to help. How do, how can I help you? What can I do? How can I help you? But I can't help you until I know what you do. So if you think about like, Think about the show uh, Undercover Boss, right? You okay, see, yeah, sure. You see these CEOs of you know million dollar revenue companies, and they can't spread ketchup on a burger bun. Like it's like, oh my gosh, how how are you running this company? That is where you get into some danger, though, because I need to be not be on the front lines, but I need to understand what my front lines are doing. I need to know, am I listening to calls? If if I had to get on the phone to take a call, could I do it? That is where I need to be. I don't need to be the expert best at all of it, but I need to be able to say, hey, yeah, you need me to jump on the phones? I'll jump on the phones. Like, that is where everybody needs to be. And with that, if you're feeling like you're stepping into something of incompetency, then you are not ready to take that promotion or that position or that lateral move because technical wise yes you may have some knowledge gaps to fill but the career skills you can hone in and the skills that kind of map from career or job to job work on those work on communication emotional intelligence you know really just listening even you listen and if you are true and honest and good intention with people as a leader people will lead you you need to respect them to earn their respect and they'll forgive you they won't expect you to be perfect I don't expect my team to be perfect I don't expect my call quality people to be perfect because they're human but that's where you get that kind of wiggle room, I guess, where if I share who I am and what what I want for them to be successful and I put them first, just like, you know, parents think about their kids, you want the world for your kids. That's how it should be for your team. And that's where even if I don't know how to do something pretty simple within my employee's role, if I say, hey, I hate to ask this, but can you show me that? They're like, of course, you know, let, let's go through this. And that's why why my wonderful agent would explain it to me eight times. <laughs> sure. Well, and I think that, you know, we said getting out of your professional depth and things like that. And, and maybe that is not quite an accurate term. But I think what maybe solves that for a lot of people, like you said, is maybe the humbleness, the humility, mm-hmm. the I don't know everything. I'm new here. And being able to be receptive. And, of course, we as human beings, when we are put in a job hunt in a new position, we have that imposter syndrome that oh, I'm, I'm just not good enough for this or anything like that. And so I think that you touched on a lot of things that, yeah, you're maybe not going to be good enough at first. And there's that old Zig Ziglar quote of, you don't have to be good to start. You have to start to be good. That's true. Mm-hmm. So next question here. What about the people who are in smaller companies? You know, you said to me earlier when I asked you how big Exact Sciences was, it's 2,000 people and, and rapidly growing. There are people out there in, in America and all, all the world over, because we do have listeners from 13, 14 some countries. It's, it's amazing. There are people who work for smaller companies. 
out there. And maybe you you can't move laterally in that company. Maybe there's only one role like yours. Or maybe you're in a corporate job and there are no opportunities upward or sideward for you. What about folks who are looking for a role to shift to outside of their current company? What would you give as advice to them on how to make the most of that? So if somebody tells me there's no opportunities for me, I'm going to call unprofessional words on them. Like, that's, <laughs> it's a load of Thank junk. you for keeping it a family show. <laughs> because if there's not opportunity, create opportunity. If you If you are working for a company that hasn't changed or expanded or done something in a new capacity of projects, like, to me, I'm thinking, oh, gosh, is this company changing with the future and evolving? And where are we going to stay static and sync? Like, if you don't change, you will not succeed because, I mean, look look outside. It's like everything is changing all the time. And so that one, again, I have a hard time with. If somebody says, oh, there's nothing for me, there's always something for you. You have to explore it. You have to understand what you want. And if you don't have the drive to get that and explore, then then you are in where you should be probably. Like, then settle for settling. Got it. Okay, so the other part of that question then Sorry, is... Sorry, I got if, the other part. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. The other part of that question, though, is... If you're not willing to settle and that company is something that's stagnant and we've always done it this way and things like that, how do I start looking for that role somewhere else? How do I make that lateral or maybe slightly upward move outside of the company structure? What are some strategies I'm looking looking at for that other than firing up a job board? You know, I would say look at what else is within your industry. Again, look at what your kind of portfolio of skills are and what other positions may also warrant those other skills also maybe at that point take take a certification something like that outside of it if you don't know where to go do something to better yourself get six sigma certified take you know emotional intelligence whatever it is take a class understand yourself better understand your relationship with people better understand how you work better because everybody works a little bit differently so if you are working to better yourself then you will better understand what you need to be doing for that next step and how to find that next step and then just research it's going to be you have to kind of get introspective and say what makes me happy is it i'll do whatever job it is as long as i have great people to work with or do i need a job that at least has X amount of pay and also has a good culture. And the amount of pay that I'm looking for when I wrap in any benefits that I'm getting, am I fully qualified for that amount? Like, what is the industry standard? So a lot of times, too, what we see is people interview and, you know, say starting base pay is $15 for a position, and they come in going, I want $25 an hour. Well, should Maybe we should end this right there because you're way off base. Like, I just can't make that happen. I don't I don't have that power with my HR department. It's going to just laugh at me. Um, <laughs> so just knowing, like, knowing your worth and not making sure you reel yourself in. Because a lot of times people say, well, I, you know, I can be that operations director because I have, you know, it says you need a minimum of five years of overseeing people. Well, Guess what? There's somebody with 15 years also applying for it. And if you're going by minimum qualifications, that's going to set you up for failure. And you don't want to do that. You want to go into something you're comfortable with that you fit into. And that's not a huge reach. You don't want to be learning brand new things that you're not ready for. Got it. So looking to those other companies and keeping things a little bit under wraps when you're in a current position. Like, let's say you're working for a company and let's Let's put it to your career. I know you moved from Humana to Exact Mm -hmm. in that case. At some point in time, you went to yourself, you know, I think I'm kind of done here at Humana. 
and you decided to look to other companies. How did that search go? What led you to sort of say, you know, okay, I can jump over here to this this particular thing, and there's an opening for me here. What tipped you off that to make that move, not necessarily from a like a personal benefit thing, but more from a this position doesn't have anything left for me. I need to go here. So for me, it wasn't, I guess that I didn't have anything left. It was that it didn't really fit what I had prioritized in my life. I wanted to have better hours that fit better with caring for my daughter, your niece. Um, and you know, I needed, I needed to have a little bit more stability rather than 12, 13 hour days. Um, you know, and I was willing to look at positions that, as long as it had decent benefits, I was like pretty open to a wide range of, you know, pay. So it's, you know, I was keeping my options open, but I also knew I need to make sure 100% that this change is a good change and that I'm not going to be getting over to a new job getting and getting let go in the next two months because I would just be you know, hitting my head on, on the desk then. <laughs> it would be terrible. So for me, it was, I was lucky because I had, you know, somebody and a couple of people that I knew had gone and changed over to exact sciences. And I, I was able to understand what their experience with the culture was and kind of understanding like it's okay to be human in, cor- in the corporate world, which sometimes it's hard to find because mm-hmm. you're you're not supposed to have things outside of work that can affect you as a human being. So it's it's difficult to say 100% that, yes, this was the right choice, you know, as you're making it because it's scary. But you have to, if you put in the work, you do the research, and you kind of ensure that you understand what your needs are and, and what you can and can't afford to lose, then, you know, you make that leap and and hope for the best. Got it. Well, and you mentioned something that you had prior colleagues that went there. Mm-hmm. And that was probably a great bridge in for you. In a, in a past episode, uh, episode 19 of this show, we talked with Brendan, who was uh, big with IBM. And he and his, his compatriots all interviewed as a group. And he mm-hmm. put this concept together of if you're working to get a job, whether it's new hire because you're out of a job or a different hire, work with a group because then if somebody somebody from your group does get hired, you have that that chain to pull you in to actually reel you into that organization because when you help somebody else get their job, they're pretty apt to maybe help you out and say, Hell yeah, do you know anybody who could fill this role? And they go, Oh, that guy, he helped me actually get the job here. You should talk to him. Yeah, I think that's something that from company to company you can see that way differently. I, um, you know, I think a lot of times there'll be areas where yes, somebody can get a ton of pull for you, um, depending on their role and their position, but there's also, you know, areas where it's just basically, Hey, tell me about what you like about the company. Is there anything that you don't, you know, what, why did you change? Do you feel that that was a good change? But they have, zero pull in, hey, you should hire this person because they are nowhere near that for, you know, it's maybe a different department or, you know, the HR um, person has the interview and somebody else has the decision making. You know, it's not just because you know somebody in, in a certain company, you know, don't bank on that, but use them as a, a great resource for understanding what the company is looking for in employees. Sure. So network in, but it's not a silver bullet. Oh God, no. (laughs) Okay. Gotcha. Good deal. There are no silver bullets. Well, Liz, thanks so much for sharing your story of all of your lateral movements and kind of how you've jumped from career to career inside of organizations and outside as well. Is there anything you want to add before we wrap things up here? I think the only thing I'd like to add is, you know, people see... A person's true nature, a person's drive, and because no matter how far you are from something, they're willing to work with you, and 
but also be able to accept sometimes if somebody says, hey, I don't think you're a good fit for leadership or for whatever you're trying to get into, but here's what you are a good fit for and here's what you have the skills for. And that's okay because we don't all fit into the same mold. So be who you are, improve who you are, and go get what you want. Sounds great. And I think that ties in really nicely with what I say frequently is that it, it's a little bit hypocritical as the host of this show and the, the CEO of Westport Studios. Uh, you might not be a number one in a business, but you might be a great number seven in, in you know hierarchy rank, if you will. So I think that that's an excellent piece of advice. My dear sister, if people wanted to find more of you, where would they be able to do that? I am not I am not big on social media and uh, all those fun things. I think I just recently learned how to Snapchat in the last year. <laughs> but if you want to find more of me, look look within yourself and find a devoted leader who wants to help people and that's where I'll be. Liz, thanks so much for guesting on the show today. Really appreciate you coming through and hopefully you'll come back and see us again in the future. For more recruiting help and other great information and people that revolve around this show, head on over to recruiting-hell.com and subscribe to Recruiting Hell Overtime, our new weekly newsletter full of extra stuff that doesn't quite fit in the show. You can also find our blog, social media accounts, show notes, and links to both our Tee Public and our Patreon page there to help support this show and your job hunt. Also, if you've escaped Recruiting Hell recently, we want to know about it. Our second escapee edition is currently in pre-production, and number three could be you. Drop us a line through RecruitingHell.com's contact form or email the show direct at TheRecruitingHellPodcast at gmail.com. Share your story with us, and you know what? We might even get you on the show. Recruiting Hell is a production of Westport Studios in beautiful Port Washington, Wisconsin, and a resident show of Podcast Town. If you're looking for more great shows or the guests that appear here on Recruiting Hell, check out RecruitingHell.com for our list of other wonderful content creators and companies that I call friends. Check them all out. They're amazing people. And hey, if you haven't subscribed, followed, or shared this show, or if you could rate this show, that would be amazing. There are millions of people the world over that could benefit from learning more about how to power up their job hunt. You're likely your friends and neighbors. Let's get them helped out. Finally, as always, a big thank you to Purple Planet Music for our themes and you, the listener, for tuning in. I'm Rob Conlon, and until we meet again... Keep moving forward with your self-betterment and your job hunt. It's a marathon, not a sprint, and Recruiting Hell will be here to help you keep pace.